it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm very grateful for the invitation to speak and to see Rachel's great piece. Um, I'm actually going to talk about that show, that the first show I did that Rachel was in, um, which will get around to the subject of the trouble with nature. But first, I'll just tell you, this is a, a work by an artist named Maurizio Catalan that I saw in Hanover during a World Expo in 2000. And this was just in the parking lot. And uh, it made me think, I think, of a, a nature revenge film. With the trees finally taking out those cars that have been giving them so much trouble. Um, but the idea for this show uh, that I did with Rachel really had its roots in my living in Los Angeles, where I was living during the 1990s up until the mid-90s. A place uh, whose intense car culture nurtures the feeling that you're always separated from the world by a perpetual windshield. And once in a vain attempt to get away from that feeling, I made a trip to Joshua Tree National Park, which is in the high desert uh, south of Los Angeles. And driving into the park area, I found myself following signs that kept saying, exhibit ahead. And I kept looking on either side of the road for some little display of text or interpretive uh, station. And there wasn't any. And finally, it dawned on me that the exhibit ahead was this endless expanse of desert stretching in all directions. And that in this park, um, nature was being really presented as a, a giant museum piece, best seen through a sheet of glass. So that seemed to sum up to me um, a certain kind of relationship we have with our surroundings. And at the same time, I began noticing work by uh, an emerging generation of artists in the 1990s that called attention and troubled our ways of thinking and looking about nature, our conventional ideas of nature, and also went a little further than this and explored how our concept of nature grows out of a particular position that we put ourselves in in relationship to the world around us, a particular way of orienting ourselves and of looking at the world around us. So the approach of these artists in the 90s was very different from that of an earlier generation. And I'm going to try to do this, so this works. Um, you know, beginning in the late 60s and early 1970s, as the environmentalist movement began taking shape, a number of artists began to experiment with new ways of making art about our relationships to the natural world. And a fair amount of this work was animated by ideals about um, ecological balance and an impulse to heal a perceived rupture between human society and the rest of the planet. And this is an image uh, of a work by Agnes Dennis, who planted two acres of wheat in 1982 in a landfill in Lower Manhattan. So that's from the World Trade Center. You can see that in the background. And it was called Wheat Field of Confrontation. And I, f I find this to be a, a very striking image that um, speaks of many different things, uh, including perhaps the role of international commerce in shaping urban life, the gulf between cities and the food sources that sustain them. It also reminds me a little bit of an outtake from a Star Trek episode that was never completed. There's something a bit archaic about this now that, that feels quite odd. Uh, at the same time, I think it also speaks of a kind of nostalgic yearning for an idealized agrarian past. Um, you know, posing with her staff and standing waist deep in the wheat, the artist presents her role as that of a, an archaic wise woman who has come to heal the disconnection between culture and nature. And utopian aspirations informed a lot of early works by artists, including the American collective Ant Farm and the German artist Joseph Beuys who, of course, in 1977 became a founding member of Germany's Green Party. Uh, Boyce believed that a harmonious existence, coexistence with nature, could only occur under the sign of art. And this was one of his projects in enacting this 1974 performance called I Like America and America Likes Me, when over a period of three days he spent eight hours in the company of a wild coyote in a downtown New York gallery. Uh, enacting at times a kind of shamanistic slapstick, um, which apparently the coyote had tremendous tolerance for. Uh, it even allowed Boyce to hug it before he left for the airport at the end of his performance. 
Um, and another example of interspecies communication was the Dolphin Embassy, a project by Ant Farm, which was also inaugurated in 1974. Ant Farm dedicated itself to interspecies communication on an equals to equals footing. And this is an image of Jim Nolman and Nancy Caldwood in the Sea of Cortez, Mexico, communicating to dolphins with music. Set up as a nonprofit foundation, the Dolphin Embassy was intended to be housed in a solar powered sea station in Australia, but was never realized. And here, Doug Michaels is explaining the idea of the embassy with the use of a sketch pad to uh, what could be a potential sponsor. Um, now, the work that I was seeing in the 1990s was evinced none of these utopian attitudes. And instead, it focused on the alienated quality of our encounters with non human life forms. And early, uh, always right, an, an early example. <laughs> of this kind of work was Damien Hirst's uh, The Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, um, which perhaps has become one of the most over-publicized artworks of the past two decades. Made in 1992, it consists of a 14-foot-long tiger shark immersed in 4,000-plus gallons of formaldehyde, all in an imposing glass and steel tank. And we associate sharks with terror and death, of course. Yet despite its title, I think this work is not concerned so much with our difficulty in grasping death, but with the ways we relate to the world through images. Her sculpture makes use of what I call a vitrine effect, the way that a glass barrier isolates an object's physicality and effectively dematerializes it. Unable to touch the object on the glass, we become instead the consumer of a distance gaze. Shielded in its minimalist display environment, Hearst's shark takes on the aspect of a quasi-metaphysical entity. It seems like an idea of a shark, or an idea about an idea of a shark. And when you see this work in person, and it's now actually at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where this image was taken, uh, in case you have a desire to see it, um, you get a much clearer idea of how the shark is dematerialized by its presentation. It's from almost every angle. You see it a bit in this slide. Um, the reflection of the glass sheet to the case, as well as the reflection of the liquid in which the shark is immersed, create a kind of sea of reflections. Uh, and you see different images showing different aspects of the shark commingled with reflections of the space around it. You never really see the shark as an feel it as an object. It's it's a it's really presented as an image. So that in the end, the uncanny charge of this piece is not its terri some terrifying lifelike quality, but is its ghostliness. Um, this? this is a piece from a few years later called "A House for Pigs and People." which was a collaboration between the German artist Rosemary Trockel and the Belgian artist Karsten Haller. And it was shown at the 1997 document in Castle, Germany. It's sort of a cross between a barnyard and a strange kind of theater. Visitors would go inside that building we saw from the outside uh, and find themselves on a sloping ramp, which was covered with carpet. And they would be seated facing this large window, which looked out onto this walled-in enclosure um, inhabited by pigs, including a large sow who was feeding her litter. And the window, like a giant vitrine, cut off any sound from the pigs, any smell from the pigs, and framed this scene purely in visual terms. Now, pigs, of course, spend a lot of time snoozing uh, and generally being immobile. And so the scene through the window often looked like a kind of tableau vivant, or even a projected still image. And even when the pigs did stir and move about, you felt like you were watching uh, a film, or a, a, the most a, a kind of performance on a distant stage. So the glass, it turned out, was in fact a two-way mirror. So the people looking inside could see the pigs, but the pigs themselves were limited to being objects to be looked at. People could walk around the back of the enclosure, and you see those people back there, they would actually see themselves looking at the pigs outside. 
Now, in an essay for the catalog that accompanied this work, the American critic Richard Schusterman offered a political reading. And this is a quote. There are also many human pigs in our social world, he observed, races and ethnicities that fail to gain our recognition because they are seen through the one-way glass of sociocultural privilege. Very often, such despised ethnicities are denigrated as swine. Now, for me, the problem with that kind of response is that it insists on reading the work within our own comfort zone in human-centric terms. And more interesting to me was Carsten Holler's description of this project as a monument of incomprehensibility. Recalling the famous remark by uh, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein that if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. Holler added that these works reflected his sense of not knowing how to really look at an animal or how it might feel to be an animal. So rather than regarding this installation as a somewhat banal metaphor for humanity's failed humanity, I'd rather see this as a work that foregrounds the limits of our current ways of looking at the non-human world. Um, I think that incomprehensibility, that idea that the artist talks about is not a dead end necessarily. I think faced with something incomprehensible, we find that often our uncertainty becomes more active and more engaged. And most of the time, of course, I think art is presented in ways that inadvertently help to extinguish any uncertainty we might have. Wall labels tell us what to think about the work, press releases, exhibition guides, well-meaning docents, all help to explain a work of art to death. And on another level, I think the very way we set up exhibitions, the way works are laid out so that the visitor can move freely from one work to the next, so that our sense of having total visual access is never disturbed. All of this conspires to make us feel like masters of an utterly transparent situation when we're in a gallery. The universe is laid out before us, and we're in the prime position to see it. Now, following in the footsteps of a house for pigs, I became aware of a pair of young Beijing-based artists named Peng Yu and Sun Yan. And they created an installation that turned that kind of viewing logic on its head. Their Safety Harbor installation, and this was a quasi-legal artwork, uh, staged in a Nanjing warehouse space that was temporarily transformed for the occasion, borrowed its visual language from the zoo. And here you see the assembled audience for the piece uh, inside a caged space. Um, outside of that space was an Asian tiger, which was patrolling the perimeter. So it was reversing the usual logic that you find in a zoo. And zoos, of course, are also a type of gallery. Zoos have curators who look after the collection and are in charge of new acquisitions. Um, and zoos also, I think, adopt a very similar kind of logic of looking that we find in galleries. So here, anyone trying to exit or enter that cage had to time their movements according to the position of this tiger, the direction it was heading in. <laughs> um, which to me was a very interesting idea. I mean, I think that, that you know, in a zoo or just as in a latrine, the animal is dematerialized in a sense by the way it's presented. And here, its physicality was restored. It could move freely around the visitors. It could stop and examine a particular visitor <laughs> through the cage, as it's doing here. Um, so to some extent, the audience found themselves in the role of being viewed objects as much as viewing subjects. Now, the whole thing, of course, was self-consciously staged as a media event, replete with camera crews and a team of security guards. And I think you saw a little of that in the first slide. But I think it links that idea of spectacle to a, the same type of logic we bring to looking at animals, and hints that there's a shared logic governing the two. So these ideas started to... Uh, developed in my head, and I, I wanted to make an exhibition that would explore this area. And I was living in London in the late 1990s and came up with this idea for an exhibition called The Greenhouse Effect um, that would look at this link between how we look at the world and, and our attitudes towards what we call nature. 
Um, I was an independent curator, so I shopped this exhibition concept around to different places and finally found the perfect home for it, which is this gallery, the Serpentine Gallery, which sits in the middle of Hyde Park. So it's surrounded by nature. And the chief curator of the gallery, Lisa Corrin, then joined me in organizing the show. Um, now, it's Serpentine has these windows which wrap around the whole building and look out into the park. So anytime you're inside the building, you're usually looking at nature unless they block it off. And the park itself is also arguably a work of artifice, even a work of art. The critic Lucy Lepard once said she thought that parks were probably the most effective public art form there is as an interface between nature and society. And certainly the order of Hyde Park which has these lovely meandering paths and planted groves and artificial waterways, is as thoughtfully framed and constructed as you know, the most elaborate natural history diorama you'll find anywhere. Now in this show, there were roughly speaking two different kinds of art. And in one type, there were artists who used living things or organic materials in their work, including plants, birds, mold, water, um, and spiders and ants, among other insects, made themselves at home in this untitled work by the British artist Anya Galaccio that consisted of a, a living apple tree on a pile of earth transplanted into the gallery. Uh, a Swedish artist named Henrik Hawkinson installed this dense jungle of upside down house plants, semi tropical house plants, uh, in which visitors could feel disoriented and even momentarily lost. French artist Michel Blasi contributed an installation that animated the gallery airspace with a network of uh, cotton balls from which uh, lentils were sprouting. So those are those hanging green <coughs> things. And these strings holding them up are actually uh, skeins of glue uh, that came from a glue gun. In a work, oops, there's a close up. And then in this work titled Your Strange Certainty Kept Still by the Danish artist Olafur Larsson, a curtain of falling water droplets uh, falls in a darkened room, illuminated by strobe lights that flash like mechanized lightning and freeze, create these frozen frames. Meanwhile, the water is filling the gallery with a sound like waterfall, like a rainfall. And the sound of birds also fill the serpentine matching the bird song heard from the park outside, courtesy of Rachel Berwick's Maypori installation, uh, which included a couple of talkative parrots. So the presence of all these living organisms in the gallery mirrored to an extent the life in the park outside. And inevitably, perhaps, they bring up that classic question of how do we define a work of art as art? Why is a tree in a gallery an artwork, but not the tree standing outside the gallery's front entrance. But to some extent, I think we've all grown accustomed to considering anything seen in a gallery as a work of art, and even the London tabloids, who are notoriously uh, famous for mocking uh, contemporary art, uh, for them this was a moot issue. And instead, visitors to this exhibition raised a very different question. Rather than was something art, they wanted to know whether it was actually nature. Um, and admittedly, there was some ground for uncertainty about the composition of certain works. Rachel's installation, for instance, commingled the chatter of the actual parrots behind this enclosure with the recordings of their voices. So you had to guess which sounds were live and which sounds were recorded. But in most cases, simply through their display in the gallery, living organisms suddenly were transformed into creations of artifice. Rendered suspect by their institutional presentation, they somehow took on this unnatural appearance and assumed, in part at least, the aura of stage scenery or props. So strange as it may seem, many visitors coming to the gallery assumed on first glance that this apple tree planted there by Anya Galaccio was a sculpture, a lifelike <laughs> simulacrum and it was only when they felt its leaves or smelled its blossoms or observed the many insects running around its branches did they actually realize this was a tree. But was it nature? 
I mean, if you look at it, you can see obviously that the branches have been trained to facilitate the harvesting of fruit. So it's a, it's a cultivated specimen. Is that something that we think of as, as nature? So that was one group of works in this show. And there was a very different group of work um, by a number of artists which consisted of deceptively realistic, lifelike uh, flora, fungi, and also insects. And this is a fly resting on the edge of this pedestal uh, created by Tom Friedman out of a group of materials including clay, hair, Play-Doh, and the substance he identifies as fuzz. That's uh, another artist named Tim Hawkinson created this root ball made from cardboard and glue. And he also hung a very delicate spider's web in one corner of the gallery that was made out of his own hair. And at the time, I thought, why would someone make a spider's web out of their own hair. And it almost invoked for me some, some almost apocalyptic feeling that it was the future moment when spiders didn't exist anymore. And to recall the memory of a spider's web, you had to make it out of your own bodily material. So in one level, these works, and including works like this bronze weed uh, by the artist Tony Mattelli or Yoshiro Suda's uh, wooden plants that were growing out of the walls of the gallery uh, provoked fascination simply on the level of their ingenious verisimilitude. Okay, the time-consuming craftsmanship and precision in this kind of work casts a spell on the viewer. It heightens and focuses our attention. Okay, and as the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard once remarked, Paying attention is a kind of magnifying glass. When we pay attention to things, our experience changes. And the intensity and close scrutiny we give works like this charges our relationship to them. And the result, as a reviewer in the New York Times once wrote about Studer's work, um, and these are some weeds he had sprouting from the cracks in the floor of the gallery was that work like this seems to bridge a gap between inert materiality and, and visionary fantasy. Now in the context of this show, The Greenhouse Effect, the capacity of this work to trigger uncertainty in a viewer was heightened by the fact that there were all these other works in the show which actually did use live materials. And shown side by side, these two types of works created a situation where the uncertainty produced by each was amplified and extended. And for me, this strategy seemed like a good way of trying to undercut the usual attitude that people bring to a gallery of being somewhat detached, um, somewhat distanced, what I would call this greenhouse mode of looking. And the uncertainty prompted by these artworks was also directed at the nature of the gallery itself. And playing off the background of Hyde Park, now this is a field of... Uh, mushrooms called Psilocybe cubenis field by Roxy Payne. These are all handmade and they are put in the gallery as if they were growing out of the floor. So there was a sense when you could look at the park outside that somehow uh, the gallery had become porous and was letting in the life outside in the park into the gallery. And they, I think these works, you know, these are some more weeds by uh, Tony Mattelli looking like they've been creeping under these French windows. So to some extent, the whole atmosphere of this gallery was transformed. You were hearing the sounds of birds, of rain, uh, and it seemed like a greenhouse gone awry um, to me. Something teeming with this uncertain life that it was holding up a very topsy-turvy mirror to the manicured order of this nice park outside, which is the kind of way we like our nature. And a few works, like those mushrooms that we looked at a second ago, and Tom Friedman's Fly. There was another work by Tom Friedman I don't have an image of, which was an overturned pedestal with a rather exquisitely made dragonfly resting on the edge of it, which looked like a, a kind of allegory of a ruin. Um, 
So some of these works, I think, really brought up somewhat specifically the idea of decay. I mean, mushrooms and flies feed on dead and rotty matter. Um, and these images of these weeds and also of this work by Michel Blasi, in which he applied a, a rice flour solution to a large wall in the gallery, causing the paint to peel off the wall. So it started to look like the gallery had some damp problem and was on the verge of becoming a somewhat squalid uh, country ruin. Um, and here's another image of uh, Michelle's piece. So you could take these artworks to a certain extent as a, making an ironic commentary on what's usually the somewhat clinical, uh, sterile nature of a contemporary art gallery. And this has been talked about, this quality, very well in a book that I think is a fantastic book called Inside the White Cube, written by the critic and artist Brian O'Doherty. And in it, he talks about the pristine nature of the contemporary art space and how in that space, the presence of your own body feels superfluous, like an unsightly intrusion. And the art being exhibited there seems to, quote, exist in a kind of eternity of display. And the gallery takes on a limbo-like status, as if you have to have died to have already been there. <laughs> and I think these comments of O'Doherty call attention to what we could call the timelessness or the suppressed temporality of the gallery space, which, like Las Vegas casinos, generally have neither windows nor clocks, as they aim to enshrine art in this kind of airtight, decay-free zone of perpetual newness. Um, so I, I, I wanted to see this gallery turned into kind of a hybrid space, where maybe you could think about how change and regeneration as well as decay are also part of the life of a gallery. And allusions to hybridity of one kind or another ran throughout this exhibition in many different ways, um, particularly in works that focused on phenomena that blurred our distinctions between something being either nature or culture. And Rachel's uh, Maypori installation um, was a key example of that. Um, that was a piece of, let's see, I think that's my next slide. It was a kind of theater of impure crosstalk between things we normally think of as either nature on the one hand or culture. And within this translucent aviary, these a pair of parrots could sometimes be heard mimicking the dialect of an exterminated South American tribe, whose language, or some 40 words of it, and Rachel, you have to correct me if I got this wrong, um, was phonetically transcribed in the 19th century by the naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. And he transcribed it not from a speaker, but from a parrot, who was perhaps the last surviving speaker of this tribe that had been massacred and wiped out. So, I think in staging this elaborate uh, cross-cultural, cross-species, cross-century feedback loop, uh, Rachel left the audience to wonder, as we're listening to these sounds we're hearing, what might be the fragment of a lost language? What might be mere noise in the signal? And what might just be two parrots chatting away to each other? Uh, and those parrots, were visible to us only as these shape-shifting silhouettes. They possessed a very shadowy status, as if they too were figments in some ill-defined zone between a life form and a representation. I've got to back up a second here to this piece, which was a different kind of hybrid. Uh, this is a work by a Welsh artist named Kareth Wynne Evans, and it consists of some potted orchids displayed next to this bottle with a yellow liquid in it. There was a wall label that told you that the artist had been feeding these orchids with his own urine, which also provided the contents for this bottle on the shelf so that the plants could continue to be watered throughout the exhibition. Now, once you read that wall text, you might think twice about leaning over and smelling the flowers up close, but I think in conjuring some kind of fantasy of like a cross-species hybrid or perhaps uh, the idea of an innocent nature being soiled by human intervention. Kareth's orchids also create a hybrid response in the person who's looking at them. 
because you'd feel not only your usual attraction to flowers, you might also feel some kind of revulsion. And so a sense of that a hybrid capacity that we all have to have two different responses at the same time is, is evoked. Um, and I think, you know, objects with hybrid identities often make us feel kind of uneasy because we don't know how to respond because we can have two different, very different responses to them at the same time. Um, now, works like this, I think, to some extent, and like Rachel's, remind us that the depiction of nature, whether in museums or natural history or in art, uh, is never really innocent or natural, but perhaps is even an inherently perverse project because there's always involved some kind of unidentified cultural baggage. Now, to some extent, though, I think these works in this show also reflected a more general shift in our definition of nature. And in his landmark book from 1989 called The End of Nature, uh, the journalist Bill McKibben argued that we could no longer conceive of a nature that was separate from human activity. As industrial pollution had reached a point that it was affecting not just local ecosystems, but was influencing the global processes that define our planetary environment. So in other words, there was nothing left on Earth that to some degree hadn't been shaped by human influence. There was no, no pure nature left that wasn't something we were a part of in some way. Now that idea, I think, um, is taken as a starting point in works by Henrik Hawkinson, uh, the Swedish artist who created, this is another view of his uh, upside down jungle, which was called After Forever, Forever All. And to make this, he went to a local kind of DIY home store and just purchased these semi-tropical houseplants. Um, and I started to think of the word a houseplant, which already seems like a strange kind of hybrid. Put them upside down, and there were very strong lights. You can just see a reflection of one, uh, encouraging the plants to grow downward. And though he's disturbing the conventions of how we normally look at plants, the plants themselves weren't disturbed. They thrived, and we had to trim them on a regular basis during the course of the show. But I think these bright lights somewhat created a sense of almost like a, a film set. And in this later iteration of this work uh, from 2006 called Fallen Forest, he actually uses these film lights as the grow lights for the plant. Um, with this and other projects, um, he's done a lot of musical projects involving insects. And this is a poster for one, uh, a monster, Monsters of Rock, in which he would bring anywhere from one to 3,000 crickets and feed their chirping through a PA system. Um, he also invented a, a, a techno club terrarium for frogs replete with a mirror ball and a live human DJ. And he, he, that was a project he initiated after he found, he thought he detected a distinct predilection among Swedish frogs for ambient techno. But in this post kind of natural world, I think Hawkinson is someone who's taking on the role of a cultural entrepreneur who's exploring new possibilities um, that can come out of the unnaturalness of, of nature, out of a different relationship between culture and nature. Now, obviously an artist like this seems a long way from the earnestness of the artists who we first looked at tonight, who helped pioneer uh, art forms in the early 70s that were engaging issues about our environment. And much of that work, as I said, was motivated besides utopian ideals, but also by a desire to make a positive, practical impact on our relationship with the environment. And maybe a, a work that a, a people often list as one of the first environmental works was a, a 1962 proposal by Joseph Boyce to clean up the Elbe River. Um, and this pragmatic approach lives on in the work of many green artists today, whose work often takes the form of sustainable design or making interventions in real world ecosystems or social systems. Uh, there's a Danish group um, called Superflex 
who make biogas units that run on manure. And they do this as an art project. And they work with communities in different parts of the world that don't have gas, access to gas. But while it doesn't have this do-good quality, I don't think of work of artists like Henrik is merely ironic. I think this kind of work troubles not only our conventional ideas of how we relate to nature, but also our conventional ideas about, what, about art and the nature of an artist's role. And these days, perhaps, the notion that nature is an invention of culture, something we've dreamed up, um, has become a bit of a truism. But I think this work takes us a step further. And it suggests that the definition of culture itself, as we currently know it, only ever made sense set in opposition to an imaginary nature with a kind of capital N that was somehow pure and utterly apart from culture. So if you turn that idea of nature upside down, you also turn some of our assumptions about culture upside down. Now to turn an object or an image on its head is often seen as a way of depriving it of meaning. But it can also be a way to free up different meanings that would otherwise be obscured. Now, the Canadian artist Rodney Graham has been photographing trees in this manner for about, starting in the early 90s, I think. And he takes these photographs with a large format camera that he turns upside down. And to some extent, these in pictures invite us to confuse high and low, to see branches for roots. And when they're quite large, and when you stand in front of one of them, your eye may try to fight to maintain its, its normal logic. It may want to see this as a lakeside reflection of a tree. Um, rather than someone who's just like a camera obscura showing us an image of a tree upside down. Now these photographs are also have a, an almost hyper-real precision to them. But I think by turning his camera upside down, Graham ensures that these majestic oaks, that these images of majestic oaks, that somehow were distance from any lingering idea that this is showing us a tree. He's insisting that this is actually a photograph. It's not a window onto a tree. But at the same time, I think he frees our attention to look at something else about trees and to focus on the incredible intricacy and logic of a tree's branching patterns, which search for light just as roots search for water. And we get, I think looking at these images, we begin to get a better image of a tree as a life system, rather than as a picturesque or romantic emblem of a solitary individual in a landscape. Now, Graham's photographs, in part, grew out of his reverence for an artwork by Robert Smithson. Uh, a series of photographs of upside-down trees that Smithson made in 1969. Now, rather than simply turning his camera upside down, Smithson took pictures of trees that he had planted upside down. So those are the roots of a tree you see there, and the tree is buried head down, as it were. Now, there's something unsettling about the inverted orientation of Smithson's tree, as if it were sounding a silent alarm, like the upside-down flag used as the international distress signal at sea. It also seems vaguely obscene or grotesque, a totem of rootlessness with a slightly sadistic tinge. After all, replanting a tree in this manner is a bit like suffocating someone by burying them head down in the sand. Smithson made three versions of this work in different settings, including one on Captiva Island in Florida where he was visiting Robert Rauschenberg. And writing about them afterwards, he claimed that flies were especially attracted by the riddle-like character of these upside-down trees. Flies, he writes, would come and go from all over to look at the upside-down trees and would peer at them with their compound eyes. He notes, and he adds that the trees are dedicated to the flies. The flies are welcome to walk on the roots with their sticky padded feet in order to get a close look. And why should flies be without art, he asks. 
Now, in dedicating an artwork to flies, I think Smithson, in a sense, is dedicating it to the possibility of other ways of seeing things. Flies, of course, inhabit a very different magnitude of scale than we do. They observe different details with their compound eyes. A fly's close look would obviously be very different from our idea of a close look. Now, in that same piece of writing, Smithson goes on to suggest that we might also imagine his upside down tree that it has slipped through a hole in the earth, migrating from one side of the planet to the other and emerging ass backwards, as it were, into the light. Perhaps these upside down trees are dislocated north and south poles, he writes, marking peripheral places, polar regions of the mind, fixed in mundane matter poles that have slipped from the moorings of the world's axis. Describing them as inverted trunks in a vast no man's land, he ends up concluding that in this Ritalian zone, nothing is for sure. Now, the idea that art can serve as a kind of Ritalian zone, where we find our conventional perspectives turned upside down, and so we have the freedom to entertain other possible ways of seeing and thinking, that lies at the heart of all the work I've been talking about tonight. And in the Greenhouse Effect exhibition, Roddy Graham's Trees, several of these were placed facing windows, looking out of the park, where you could see similar trees looking back at these. And it was my hope that with a bit of imagination, viewers, visitors in the exhibition might imagine that the gallery had somehow become a kind of camera obscura and was reflecting this inverted image of the world outside. And certainly it was my deepest hope in organizing this show with Lisa that visitors to the gallery would return to the park outside after seeing the show with a slightly different perspective than how they usually looked at and related to the things they saw around them. Now, is that all we can ask of art at this particular moment, a moment which many people feel is in a moment of impending global crisis? We've just seen the summit in Copenhagen fail abysmally, and it seems clear that there's a very good chance we won't be able to reduce global emissions sufficiently in the future to avoid a catastrophic future. So should an artist be doing all they can to respond to this state of emergency? Yet despite the growing number of artists who are producing models for sustainable design or making practical interventions, or ecoventions, as these are sometimes called, I don't really think that art is going to provide us with a viable way forward to mitigate or deal with the effects of global warming. And I think it's a mistake to ask that of art. Yet we certainly do need to make a profound shift in the way we think about the world, and maybe art can play some role in that. Perhaps it can help us to overcome our lingering conception of nature as something other that exists outside of us. And it can do that in part, I think, by reminding us that art is never more concerned with social transactions, including the transactions between an exhibition and its audience, than when it deals with the subject of the natural world. And I think this is the great ironic discovery offered by all these works I've discussed here tonight. Um, now, that's, you have, that's the end of my talk, but I'm just going to show you a couple of, um, I'm tracking trees these days and following that image of Smithson's upside down tree. This is another work he made in 1969 uh, called Dead Tree, in which he dragged a 40 foot long tree into an exhibition hall in Dusseldorf. And then you can see these mirrors uh, that are inserted around its branches and under the bough that would reflect a visitor's image and mingle it with images, fragmented images of the tree and of the space around it. And this uh, piece several years ago was restaged by two artists in a gallery in Brooklyn in a much smaller space where you get a sense of a tree, a dead tree as an obstacle. It's something you have to squeeze by or step over. It changes the way you move through a space. Um, and I think works like this do ask this question. This is, a, this is a dead tree, and it's also a work of art. So how do you determine its status? It's both things at once. 
and it, it eludes the kind of way we want to fix things in precise categories all the time. Uh, this is another work by Maritza Catalan from the early 90s with an olive tree on top of this kind of minimalist block of earth. Uh, this was a piece by Zoe Leonard from the late 90s in which she reconstructed a tree with some steel prosthesis in a, a gallery in New York. And this was a kind of uh, another version of that project by Anya Galaccio realized in London where a tree is dismantled into small pieces and then reassembled. And in a way it makes you, I think, think that every memory we have of a tree is something that we reassemble in our mind from a lot of different trees we've seen. This is an upside down pair of pants on a tree played on that earlier uh, work, a piece by Peter Coffin. Um, and when it, we were working on the Serpentine show, I kept having this idea that someone would make some clothes for the trees in the park. Uh, I had to wait a while for that one. This is a work by Roxy Payne of a steel tree in Central Park. Uh, Natalie Jeremenko uh, did this project called A Hundred Trees. These were clones of trees which were then planted all over different parts of San Francisco. Um, and these are some photographs uh, by Zoe Leonard uh, who's observed trees in New York that change their shape in relationship to their environment. And these are a couple of images of trees uh, that end up getting twisted around these fence structures. Uh, this was kind of an atomic tree uh, by Michelle Blasi, which is, that's actually a kind of yellow mold which has gro grown on a substructure of wet spaghetti. <laughs> um, these are pieces you sometimes find on yourselves after you've left the gallery, little bits of them. Uh, finally, this is a piece by Diller and Scafidio uh, called Arbor Vitae, uh, which was the tree of knowledge, of trees that were planted on moving, rotating uh, pieces of earth. So seen from a distance, the forest seemed to be swaying back and forth and trees were moving around, almost like that uh, moment in Hamlet. And finally, uh, an exploding tree by a German artist named Michael Seelsdorfer. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Um, so, if there are any questions, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Who's got the parrots? Rachel, who's got the parrots? <laughs> How's their uh, dialect? Um, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Are they really? That's huh. Have they uh, elaborated any variation to the dialect? <laughs> yeah. Question? Well, I think, you know, it's funny, there's that pair of uh, Chinese artists, um, Peng Yu and Sun Wan, have made works using <coughs> bodies of people. Um, but I think for the most part what you'd end up with is this kind of a representation. And there is a lot of lifelike uh, trompe l'oeil sculpture of people. Um, but I think this other work is, part of it at least, is exploring this line of using live materials. And um, that could get tricky, using people. <laughs> um, Well, would the human exist as a category? Yeah, that's the ultimate question maybe posed by this kind of work. 
Um, and I think it's, I think maybe the question there more is how, how that category of the human is, what supports it? Okay, because it's just a category. We're the only ones entertaining the idea that we're humans. Um, and I think some of the things that support it are these kind of relationships like the, uh, that piece of House for Pigs and People brought up. Um, you know, which is a kind of classic relationship of someone who's a, an unseen observer and someone who's an object being looked at. Um, I mean, maybe what we think of as human is some idea of subjectivity. And so I think we've done a lot to either create fan a fantasy subjectivity a la Disneyland for animals or to deprive uh, the landscape of any sense of what animal subjectivity might be. Yes? That doesn't really work out. I mean, you can't, you know, I mean, if you bought the, say, one of these Henrik Hawkinson upside down pieces, you'd probably get a piece of paper that gave you the right to install it should you want to install it. Um, but you, you don't buy the actual plants. And those pieces like Anya Galaccio's apple tree, um, I mean, most of these artists are working with live things or getting them. Rescuing a tree, say that's about to be cut down in an orchard. Uh, but no one would buy that tree because the work only makes sense as a work responding to the, the rhetoric of the gallery around it. I mean, uh, that tree in your home would just be a plant. <laughs> um, which is a very, you know, um, I mean, it's funny in a way, a lot of this work is very conceptually based work, even though it's dealing with earthy things. <laughs>